Welcome to the American University Museum. I'm Jack Rasmussen, the director and curator. We would like to begin this program with a land acknowledgement, something that public officials and universities and other nonprofits are incorporating more and more into their public statements and regular communications. It's a way of transforming and undoing the intentional erasure of the indigenous people of the land and feels even more appropriate in the context of today's discussion. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. About two years ago, I approached Dr. Segal about curating an exhibition of works by Israeli artists in our collections, which included gifts from Nancy Berman and Alan Block and those drawn from our Rothfeld collection of contemporary Israeli art. Noam Segal is a, an independent curator and researcher based in Brooklyn, New York. She holds a PhD and MA in hermeneutics and culture studies from Bar Ilan University and a BA in philosophy and political science from Tel Aviv University. Her practice is focused on curating, contextualizing, which she does so well in this exhibition, and producing new media and performance. Dr. Segal has collaborated with numerous international institutions such as Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Performa in New York City, BAM, Brooklyn, New York, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, Castello di Rivoli in Turin, Kunstwerden Nuremberg, and Kunstwerk Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin. She was the curator of the 2020 Aurora Biennale Biennial in Dallas, Texas. Segal is currently working with Front International 2022 Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art. She is part of the 12th Berlin uh, Biennial Artistic Team, a visiting scholar at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts Department of Performance Studies and a faculty member at the Curatorial Studies Department at School of Visual Arts in New York City. Noam, we're so happy to have you here tonight to talk with us about your exhibition. We would like to reserve time at the end for questions and comments from the audience. We encourage you, the audience, to participate by pressing your chat button at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, Noam, please take it away. The exhibition is comprised of works in the American University Museum, Rothfeld Collection of Contemporary Israeli Art, and gifts from the Nancy Berman and Alan Block. It includes work from the 1950s through the early oats. The mostly men, anonymously Jewish, and mostly Ashkenazi group of artists represent local art movements whose inherited bias towards modernism and the Western canon is repeatedly demonstrated by their formal preferences. In this sense, the artworks adhere to the modernist framework common to this time. They represent dominant artistic movements in Israel and portray participants lacking any substantial racial or ethnic diversity. This exhibition is not exhaustive, instead it is concerned with a specific relationship between history, land and landscape. Landscape painting is European in its origins. Landscapes help construct national identities through imperial iconography, build nationalist sentiment, and create and reproduce ethnic and racial stereotypes. Never a mere depiction of a land as it is, or it's in natural state, landscapes traffic in amnesia, erasure, and historical revision. Many of the works in the show have been read as symptoms of the trauma of Holocaust survivors, of anti-Semitic experiences, and of those who lived through Israel's turbulent funding. 
This show takes as its beginning a visual language of double meaning from which critical views of Israeli state policies begin to emerge. This show rereads this body of work as a series of coded reflections and critics of state policies. The violence against the refugee Arab population, the silencing of domestic political critics, the oppressive colonialist nature of land management policies, and the ongoing attempts to erase all traces of Palestinian presence in land, agriculture, and in written and visual record. These readings are not new, but have been talked about in the main discourse. This normalizing cultural production included modernist visual art, which translated the genres and tropes common to Western art into a local vocabulary that was, like the Hebrew language, cultivated by the state's nationalist project. My main curatorial responsibility in this show was to decode those local signifiers for international audience. Two black and white photographs welcome visitors to the exhibition. The joyful devoted farmers in these images are the epitome of the Zionist pioneer. They are here to cultivate the allegedly empty desert that makes up the Holy Land. Just as the land was not actually empty, the pioneer Itas depicted here is not unique. It was modeled after 19th century European colonialism and contained nationalist sentiments from the early struggles against the British mandate. The photographs are part of a series, The Missing Negatives of the Sonnenfeld Collection from 2008 by artist Yael Bartana. Lenny and Herbert Sonnenfeld took the original photographs of the Jewish inhabitants in Palestine between 1933 and 1948 and adhered to the Zionist worldview. Combined with many other photographic depictions from that time, the Sonnenfeld images contribute to the idea that Palestine was empty. Bartana intervenes in this archive of collective memory that the Sonnenfeld created to make a historical correction, tikkun if you will. She portrays the same traits and characteristics that were used to represent the early Zionist pioneer and subvert them by including other residents, our Palestinian refugees currently living in the occupied territories, our Palestinian within the 1948 borders, and the Arab Jews. These ethnic groups are largely missing from this politicized visual language. The show is organized into seven sections in a chronological order. So uh, starting from the beginning, actually the first work is from 54, uh, and it shows Jacob Steinhardt's woodcut. And I think it's important to understand here in this, the way that Steinhardt, who was an immigrant, European immigrant coming from Poland, his impressions from that local landscape. So before delving into the first modernist art movement in Israel, Ofakim Chadashim, New Horizons, that they're paintings and works were mostly characterized by the white color. Steinhardt's depiction here is actually black. Of course, it depicts uh, nighttime. But what is interesting in here is how the bodies of the Bedouins are actually encrypted into the landscape. So as you can see here, and in many of the early works, the locals, the natives were seen as part of the landscape, meaning they were objectified into the composition and the foundations of the paintings, but they were never seen as having agency, having an independent agency. And this uh, woodcut shows it in a very um, beautiful way. Steinhardt was not part of Ofakim Chadashim, as I said, and the, the, one of the main things that characterized them, as I said, was the use of white light. Uh, mainly because they were immigrants from Europe and the, the blinding sun was kind of like very, very shocking to them. And it will become evident later for the artists who were more um, fascinated by the light change and comparison to natives that were already accustomed to that. This work by Naftali Bezem is commenting on the murder of Arabs at the Kfar Kassa massacre in 1956 and it exposes vision for a better future of solidarity and hope. 
This work, titled In the Courtyard or the Third Temple from 1957, depicts three Jewish women mourning over the body of an Arab. It critiques the Jewish domination of that land and its potential consequences. In Besom's work, it's also important to note that the female figure is a representation of the idea of peace. And this is kind of like a futuristic understanding of what may happen in the future going forward with the plans for a third temple house. This work is not in the show, but I found this work um, to be particularly eerie in, in this framework. Um, again, as I mentioned, the representation of the women in his works signifies the idea of peace. And this work is called Blessing the Shabbat. Now, I don't know if you can see here, but on the bottom part of the drawing, there are houses, right? If you can see here, it's like the early uh, settlement in, in Israel. And the work is called Blessing the Shabbat. What I saw here is a man who's holding a woman from behind. Uh, many will say that a hug that is coming from behind is not a hug that is of love, but more of an, uh, a sexual connotation. Um, you can see how he holds her body and they almost go like almost like a cross, almost like a pieta movement where there is some sort of a sacrifice being made. Uh, however, the work is called Blessing the Shabbat. So by its title, it should provide a sense of uh, security or some coziness and holiness. But as we see here, the man is hugging the women. The woman is being stationed in an unnatural position, clearly. And her body is, of course, bare. And as he comes behind her, she is holding the Shabbat candles. But as we see and we look down, we see that these are not necessarily 100% Shabbat candles, but they are two objects that are being anchored into the ground objects that stands for uh, something that is not a Shabbat candle. So as you look down, you can see that those objects are actually seen much more like pitchforks rather than uh, holy candlesticks. Uh, and then again, just to remind that the figure of the woman in his work is symbolizing the idea of peace. So that was when I was trying to say that the ambivalence towards uh, state policies were already evident at the beginning of the foundation of the state in the first 20 years, for instance, this is a work by Hanan Simon, who was actually part of Ufukim Chadashim and was also part of the uh, European immigrants who arrived to Israel and were kind of stunned by the local sun. Um, Hanan Simon did participate in cultivating the national narrative, uh, but then somewhere in the late 50s, early 60s, he traveled to Brazil and came back and then quoted saying that he is no longer in the business of doing art in the service of the state. As we can see in this surrealist rendering, Simone depicted the land in a fragmented and non-cohesive manner that shifted from his previous artistic style. This is uh, Okashi's work. It's another work that was made by artists who was actually part of Ufukim Chadashim, but unlike most of them, was actually a native to Palestine. He was born in 1909 in Rishon LeZion, coming from a Yemenite descent. At that time, he was a very prominent international artist, but in the local canon until today, He's not as known, or nor he got the um, retrospectives and the scholarly research that one would think one should get. Amongst his group, amongst Ofukim Hadashim group, he used to be known as the Black because of his darker skin color. And interestingly enough, at some point in his career, he switched to work on big formats with uh, deep fields of black colors. It was never just black. There were always lots of color fields underneath, um, always covered with black. And for him, the black color is the most suitable one to symbolize the experience of the Jewish artist. 
So basically the beginning part marked the first, let's say, question mark that came about in relation to state policies. And now I just want to jump into a different work that is actually not part of the exhibition, but I want to mention that just to show how a materiality supplements different values when we talk about other geographies. So land artworks were made in the 70s in Israel, um, different actions, not only by artists who are in the show, many artists who are not in the show dealt with land to kind of like give way to different political criticisms. Amongst them is also David Ginton and Moti Mizrahi and Micha Uman. Here I just want to mention the work of Pinchas Kongan. An immigrant with a critical connection to his surroundings, Cohen Gunn's work from this period should be understood as part of his wider conceptual political practice. In the early 1970s, he was engaged in a series of actions and land art projects that mostly dealt with the Israel-Palestinian situation. In the action touching the border from 1974, he delegated four civilians to hide semi-confidential security information at different points on the borders of Israel where they were halted by the Israeli army. The work points out the political nature of national borders and their tendency to change frequently due to current events, suggesting that the border is cultural rather than essential or permanent. This work points out the political nature of national borders and their tendency to change frequently due to current events, suggesting that the border is cultural rather than essential or permanent. More importantly, he reframed the idea of national security as a metastructure in a tool that dictates the circulation of information, transparency, human rights and freedom of movement. The work was activated only when the delegated pedestrian encountered and was halted by the gatekeeper, meaning the IDF soldier, suggesting that a cultural border is only apparent when it is being breached. Touching the border established a coded information system inscribed in landscape to highlight the different status that information attains when it is a matter of security. Land here is not an abstract representation, but the core of the conflict, the Nakba, and the occupation. This work emphasizes the connection between land, data, knowledge, and the arbitrariness of the activation of borders. This section of Blocking the Other speaks to ideas of accessibility and proximity to information and who gets access to it. In this geography, Accessibility is determined by ethnicity. These are the works that are representing the 70s in the show. And what you see here is actually boxes, perspex boxes, that within them there are newspapers. But the paper has been blocked, crumbled, cut, painted over. And basically what Pinhas Cohen Gunn is doing is he denies our accessibility to the information the text conveys, he crumbles those papers and then creates a synthetic landscape out of them. And out of this like denial of language and information to form a synthetic landscape. And during that time, Galia bar a uh, very uh, noted Israeli curator wrote about the idea of blocking the other. During the seventies, a lot of these works were dealing with the concept of blocking the other people already were in understanding that the figure of the Palestinian as a subject, as a person with an agency, is being completely denied from the Israeli mental landscape. Another work by Jacob Hanani. Jacob Hanani was born in Morocco, and what we don't see here is actually the micrographic nature of the text that is made from tiny, tiny uh, letters in Hebrew. Uh, basically, one cannot see the letters only if you stand in a very close proximity to the text. And it also reproduces this idea of proximity and accessibility to information uh, and really about like the 
perspective of the viewer and what kind of accessibility one gets in order to receive the information and being an able receiver of this information. And in that geography, it has to do clearly with your ethnicity. So this is something that became evident in the 70s and more and more uh, with other works later on. The next section is Blocking the Gaze, dealing with works between 1980 to 1999. The 80s and the early 90s were turbulent in Israel and Palestine. A number of political events influenced the way that Israeli artists reinstated the connection to transparency, opacity, and the direction of the public gaze. The works from this series depict mostly underground bunkers in a way that portrayed both the ongoing occupation and battles over the land. Micha Ullman interventionist practice is exemplary. In one of his actions, Uman exchanged the soil of a kibbutz with a neighboring Arabic village to amplify questions of ownership and to build solidarity with previous owners of the land through an act of appropriation. Michal Rovner created Outside from 1990, a series of sites depicted through blurriness and distortion of the gaze. The sites are mostly Palestinian refugee camps or Bedouin encampments. The series suggests both their visual inaccessibility to the Israeli gaze and their distorted existence in national hegemonic imagery. The following section deals with index art. In this section, the work subtly registers the inscription of military hegemony in landscape. They capture Israeli landscape in a classical devotion, traditional composition, virgin land, and horizon lines that at first glance lend themselves to the formal national story. Yet they index something else. The views are wounded and tactically punctuated by militaristic interventions. Smoke seen from afar, traces of military vehicles, or empty bullets coded into the land. The traces do not only function as indicators or hints of a missing thing that could or should have been there. They function as evidence of something that disappeared and that was removed from that landscape. They testify on their own history of disappearance and uprooting. Indexical works point to the traces of data that indicate something that was removed from the signifying order of things. Here, the index function as a means to make the absent present by revealing its coded traces and its removal from the landscape. They don't only indicate the absence of these traces, but the active erasure of their existence. They expand on the apparatus of indexical art as proposed by Rosalind Krauss by excavating the missing place and its informed erasure. So here, what we can see are military vehicles. There are a few other works in the show that are not here in the presentation, but basically many of those artworks um, show different military events. They don't show the event, of course, as in index art, but they add another layer of hinting or giving some traces to the active experiment to omit and annul those traces from landscape. This is a fascinating work by Miriam Cabeza, who is an Israeli painter uh, born in Morocco. This painting is made in her matter of abstract expressionism, but it presents an alternative logic that includes a focal point, horizontal structure, and a clear hierarchical composition. The upper parts of the painting are drenched with bright colors, but most of the canvas is covered with thick black layers. A stenciled figure is reproduced across the lower width of the canvas. It presents allegedly Egyptian figures whipping others next to the pyramids. The others are likely to be the enslaved Jewish Israelite people. The largest portion of this work is blackened, superimposed under the depiction of a whip that rises above the rendering of the Egyptian meat. 
The whip is the painting focal point and therefore the main constitutive controlling element of the work. In this sense, the whip guides the movement of the painting and of the gaze. This section deals with ecology. Environmental destruction cannot be disassociated from processes of modernization, urbanization and colonization. Israel's policies in the occupied territories in relation to ecology and agriculture are less known internationally. Many are familiar with the olive trees, their importance to the Palestinian community and their ongoing abuse by Jewish settlers in the occupied territories. In the past few years, there has been a growing momentum of settler violence directed at Palestinians, particularly during harvesting season. These attacks on centuries-old trees and traditions result in violence against the general population and farmers cut off of their land. Less well-known is the Israeli handling of plants like Akub, Zatar, and Mirame, since 1977, Israel has regulated the harvesting of these plants in ways that directly affect the lives of Palestinians. It is another bureaucratic tool of land preservation that supports the cellular colonial agenda in the occupied territories. So this work by Ori Gersh is called Olive Tree 17. It's from 2004. And what we can see here, of course, it's a tree that had been pulled out. We can see the bottom of its log right here. This tree, as you can see, is very big and it's probably like at least 300 years old. Uh, what is interesting here is that this work to me is also kind of like the uh, link between the part that deals with uh, ecologies of disappearance to the next part that talks about submerge and erupt, because as you can see also here, the work is erupted in a way. So what Ori did is that he used long exposure that as you can see here in the upper parts of this photograph, uh, burned down the negative. And in that sense, there is something that exceeds the borders and the limit of the photography of the print. And it leaks out to the viewer. It's like the art object is burned down, is annulled in many instances to talk about that thing, that traumatic erasure that escapes aesthetic boundaries. The last section of this show deals with images from the 2000 and on that mostly show different eruptions. The shifting gaze of the artist in this show revealed the deep social processes of reckoning within secular Israeli society. From hesitant question marks and locally visible cracks that began to emerge in the 50s with young nationhood, to the consequences of waking from the Zionist dream in the 60s and 70s, the show lays out the evolution of political consciousness that led to recent artistic interventions. What began as questioning the necessary violence that accompanies nation building developed into representations of the concealment and silence that accompanied this state violence. This evolution reflects the linguistic terrain where the Hebrew word for occupation, kibush, has been so thoroughly delegitimized that it is practically disappearing. It has been largely removed from school books or has devolved into a nonsense. After the occupation was removed from available systems of signification, it was excluded from the language itself. Not only was resistance impossible, verbal acknowledgement and debate were less viable than ever. The erasure or denial of trauma has inevitable, tragic and dramatic results. Trauma does not disappear when silence is imposed. The lack of compatibility between the acknowledged traumatized past of Israelis and the ongoing unacknowledged Nakba of Palestinians by the state of Israel paves the way for a complete annihilation of humanistic values. It plays out as the fundamental reversal of the guiding principle of the Israeli state and Judaism as a religion of social justice. This active denial results in an ongoing, escalating settler violence and other processes of ethnic cleansing and displacement. 
What the images from this period show us is fragmentation, discontinued lines, lack of continuity and contiguity, explosions and fragility. They imply a nascent recognition or reckoning. There is a tension between the actions of the state and the image of the state. The difference between the story that Israel tells about itself and reality that is undeniable. In this work by Gal Weinstein, untitled from 2006, this work represents his wider practice of working with synthetic, cheap, and easy to obtain in largely ephemeral materials. He illustrates local landscapes and places that hold symbolic, mythical, or historical value in local culture. In these constructions, the artist presents a version of these sites that expose themselves as barren, futile, and synthetically engineered. This work, made with remnants of steel wool, shows us empty landscape with an explosion. The image is so delicate and fragile that a closer look will expose its lack of inner continuity, its explosive, fragmented, and fractured nature. His traditional choice in rendering Israeli mythical, non-religious sites through flammable, synthetic materials points to failure, disintegration, and annihilation. Uh, this work by Roy Cooper, who his works are very significant in the index part, is actually taking a shot of the Mediterranean, but as you can see in the title, it says no escape from the past series. And it speaks to itself. It's very narrow and the work more kind of like declares itself as a no exit sign than an infinite frontier. The last two works in the show are video works by Gilad Ratman and Michali Bar-Or. Ratman's two-channel work shows a group of individuals drowning in a swamp. Members of this community perform full vertical submergence in a mud pit to the point of disappearance. This disturbing, suffocating happening portrays drowning. Barors is the only work on loan here and the only work that includes the voice of the Arab subject. It is focused on the marshes that were drained by the early Zionists as part of the Conquering the Land movement. In the two-channel work In Smaller Place from 2021, Boror converses with Muhammad Amash, a historian and a native of Jasser Azarka, today a village in northern Israel. Amash recounts the history of the village residents who lived beside the Kabara Marsh and drew their livelihood and trade from it for 600 years. His story closes the show as the viewer is stationed back in front of the missing negatives of the Sonnenfeld collection. In 1950, in the fight for decolonization of Africa, poet Amy Cesar observed that colonization works to decivilize the colonizer. In this formulation, the colonizer is the product of his own dehumanization. Colonization dehumanizes even the most civilized men. The colonizer who, in order to ease his conscience, gets into the habit of seeing the other man as an animal accustoms himself to treating him like an animal and tends objectively to transform himself into an animal. It's beyond denial that Israel has executed colonial acts. And this quote by Emmy Cesar stands for this catalyst for the last artistic phase, whether if it's, it's not only the reproduction of trauma that is directed at underness, but it's also the self-reproduction of the traumatizer. This could be one of the reasons that have led to this aesthetic uh, evolution of local landscapes. Thank you so much, Naran. Do we have any questions in the chat? I have, I have uh, one question myself. Uh, Noam, I'd like to hear about your curatorial practice. Um, you know, we started this maybe a couple of years ago, I, I, that far back. I, but, uh, and during that time, I asked you if you could work with our collections to come up with the show. And I think you came back with 
many, many ideas as you know, you went through what we had and what we didn't have. Um, and uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, how you came to produce this really exceptional show for us. Uh, I imagine it wasn't easy. Yeah, I guess it's the time also, right? It's the times, it's... Um, yes. Times of, yeah. Um, at first, I, uh, it was wonderful to get acquainted with the collections. They have so many, you know, works that I haven't seen for years. Also works that I, it was the first time I got to uh, see in person. Um, so it was really a joyful moment. And if you remember at the beginning, we we're hoping to create a show around uh, that actually emerged from Okashi's practice. Uh, so that was, you know, in the spirit of everything that's going on right now. And, um, and with the political sensitivity, it felt only the right moment to also reevaluate some of the understanding about Israel uh, and about Israeli art, particularly here. Um, so my first, of course, my first proposition had to do with the work of um, Israeli uh, men and our our Jewish personal artist uh, that is largely not found in Jewish uh, museums in America and you know and in such as in many many other places. Uh, and then we switched to this one. But basically, my practice was always very um, minded in you know politically minded and socially minded, uh, whether if it's performance works or if it's new media and installation practice or painting. Uh, in that sense, I, I am an art historian, um, but I yeah, my tendency is also to see and think about things in their, um, I'm going to say, matrixial form. Matrixial is a notion that another Israeli artist, uh, Braha Ettinger, who's a psychoanalyst, um, created a few years ago, and basically to speak about the fact that every experience we have have different matrix, different matrixes around it. Um, and she was also, um, she participated in the early war of Israel, and she is a very strong, uh, in, of course, from as an Israeli. Um, and then today is she's one of the she's a very vocal advocate against the occupation. Um, so just to say that the I, I feel like the local experience is very very um, complex and convoluted, of course, like many other places. But it was really um, a pleasure for me to be able to bring this this complexity forward. <clears throat> it was a, a pleasure for us as well. Uh, we like to uh, address issues in the museum uh, and, and maybe you know skirt the uh, the danger, the dangerous edge or something. Uh, but uh, and you've done it just so so very very well here. And I know it wasn't you. It's not intentional. You're skirting dangerous issues. It's more like addressing issues that. Uh, when explored, take you some to some difficult truths. That's kind of true. So, how would you would you what would you do if you did this show again? Um, I would fundraise. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but I'm sure the thing is that the show is really it's an index in itself because. If we would have right a basement with a lot of the important and the you know a variety of Israeli artworks, the sh the same show with the same premise could have happened and just in a much more expanded manner, because mm -hmm. basically the chronology that I'm trying to delineate is evident in Israeli art, and it's part of the canon and it should be part of the canon because it's also part of our existence and our life experience. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're tangled together. And, and I believe it sheds lights also on the inner, let's say domestic experience, right? But also about how we, um, how the Israeli state, um, you know, the history of the Israeli state, let's say, without 
too many words. Um, and yes, yeah, so I believe this show can happen in, in a much more expansive manner, uh, but really with the same arguments. So it's, mm -hmm. I guess it's also a jumping board. <clears throat> it's uh, beautifully organized and paced and, uh, and I suppose, uh, well, I would have to describe you as relentless. I think that that might be a good description. You uh, really began to develop some concepts which you know, you would not be dissuaded dissuaded from. Uh, and uh, I thank you for that those efforts. Thank you. We have a few comments. Uh, I thank you for this presentation. I feel enlightened by listening to you and seeing this work. I feel the same way. You know, I curated a show of most of this work in the past. Uh, most of this work has been seen, but I must say uh, it's an entirely different show in your hands. And, uh, and I think a, uh, a really, really powerful show. I, th I think when talking to the artists, I could sense uh, a, and, and engage in deeper discussions about what the meaning of the work, but I never tried to address it uh, in black and white on the wall uh, the way you have. And I think that's the show is just very rich for that. You know, that you. effort we made. I, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I want to encourage everybody to come and see the show. And by the way, there's a great catalog. Uh, I think that uh, it's, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so proud of it. It really is a, a wonderful piece. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And, and uh, uh, come down and see the show. And um, it's, it's a great experience. With that, we're going to say good night. And thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Tonight, we will be discussing our current exhibition, In Place of a Different Place, curated by Dr. Noam Segong.